Welcome to the Thomistic Institute podcast. Every talk on this podcast was originally delivered at an in-person event for university students, perhaps for one of our Thomistic Institute chapters on a university campus or at a Thomistic Institute retreat or conference. These lectures and events are happening around the country and around the globe all the time. To learn more, visit us at www.thomisticinstitute.org and sign up for our email list. We'll keep you posted about what's happening next. And finally, please subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to like and share these recordings with your friends because it matters what you think. So just to remind you this morning that the theology of the body is a series of catechetical addresses delivered by St. John Paul II virtually every Wednesday from 1979 to 1984. Uh, he missed some Wednesdays, Wednesdays when he was shot. Um, he missed, uh, one, he took one year off for the, Mar- I think it was the Marian Holy Year. Or there was a holy year in that, in that uh, time frame. So one of the things, uh, every, everything that you know, John said yesterday, I would just add that one of the things that the, catechi- that the theology of the body is as well is just that. It's catechetical addresses. So they're intended to catechize. Um, in these addresses, he's attempting to educate Christians. He didn't write the theology of the body necessarily to convince non-Christians or non-Catholics. Okay. So in that sense, it's not intended to be an apologia. It's not apologetics that he's doing. And this is, and this flows from the fact that the theology of the body takes scripture as its starting point. In the theology of the body, St. John Paul II is not interested in making philosophical arguments for the truths that he presents, even though all his life he considered himself primarily a philosopher. Throughout his early career, Carol Wojtyla, as a priest, came to be concerned because, and this has been noted by a number of his biographers, he came to be concerned that theology and philosophy had become too abstract and too disconnected from the experience of the lives of the faithful in the pews. So think uh, the 1950s is when he is a young priest. And it's noted that he spent much of his time as a young priest with young families. So he was interacting with couples as they were dating and getting to know each other and as they were first having children and as uh, he would see them go through and get to know their parents and grandparents. So he, in fact, uh, this was his nickname, right? Lolek, which means uncle. Um, He was sort of an uncle to a lot of a lot of youth in Poland. And it was that experience that sort of, even though he was very fascinated by philosophy and theology, made him realize that for many of the young people in Poland, the church's teaching, especially around marriage and sexuality, was sort of falling flat, we might say. So this is often, this is why he dabbles, uh, Dr. Grabowski mentioned this last night, he dabbles in things like phenomenology, you know, the philosophy of human experience. Now, even though he was interested in reconnecting theological and philosophical thought with human experience, or at least speaking theologically and philosophically in a way that would connect the lives of the faithful to the church's teaching and to Jesus Christ, this is an important point always to remember he is a follower of Jesus Christ. And Christians, there, and Christians believe that the world makes sense, that creation makes sense and has a purpose, and that we can learn from it. John Paul, even though he's very interested in human experience, is no relativist. He believes that creation is reasonable. He believes that revelation is reasonable, even though it's oftentimes mysterious. The theology of the body has several treaties or themes, we might say. Um, it begins with a catechesis on the book of Genesis. It include, then it goes to a catechesis on the Sermon on the Mount. He spends time on St. Paul's teaching on the human body, the resurrection of the body, 
And then he moves into the vocations, spending time on virginity for the sake of the kingdom, but more especially the sacrament of marriage. And then he concludes with reflections on humane vitae. And so while the theology of the body, while humane vitae, the, the theology of the body is not a defense of humane vitae, it certainly was an inspiration for the theology of the body. John Paul spent much of the 70s writing essays and articles trying to defend um, Paul VI's claim that in the conjugal act of marriage, the unitive and the procreative are inseparable, which was the point of disagreement between the minority and the majority of the commission that John spoke of last evening, right? In fact, as they were, when you read Humanae Vitae, it reads like the majority report until you get to paragraph 12. And that's where John, that's where Paul VI decidedly goes against what the majority thought. And that's where he says, um, that the unitive and procreative aspects of the conjugal act are, are simply inseparable. But why? He never really kind of explains why. That's the problem, right? And so he leaves it to be explained. And that's sort of the, the, the task Carol Wojtyla took up during the 70s. Okay, so to begin, I'm going to be focusing this uh, morning mostly on the catechesis on Genesis the first and the core uh, of the catechesis with some sprinklings going forward and with some reflections on John Paul's understanding of the resurrection. This afternoon, in, in the final talk of our weekend, I'll go into more on the redemption of the body and how this is lived in the, in the, in the vocations uh, that John Paul talks about. I'll, of course, be interspersing some Thomism here and there, because, well, St. Thomas is always right. And uh, this is the Dominican House of Studies, and I am a Dominican, and this is the Thomistic Institute, and it's his feast day. So you'll indulge me on that. To begin, the scriptural foundation for the theology of the body is really the creation story that is found in the second and third chapters of Genesis. We all know the story. So remember, the first chapter of Genesis is the seven days. But then the second chapter, we get the story that God creates man, places him in the garden, and then sees that it is not good for the man to be alone. After bringing all the animals to the man, God creates the woman to be his partner. For John Paul, and this is a quote, he says, chapter two of Genesis constitutes in some way the oldest description and record of man's self-understanding. And together with chapter 3, it is the first witness of human consciousness. I don't know whether he intended this or if he had been talking to Ratzinger at the time, although probably not. Um, this sort of anticipates Joseph Ratzinger's biblical understanding of biblical inspiration, that of course, we don't take Genesis 1 through 11 literally, but that in the process of divine inspiration of Scripture, Ratzinger would argue, argues that what's going on is not always God simply telling the sacred author what to write down, but rather it's the whole process by which God reveals and man responds the community of Israel responds. And so when you read especially the Old Testament, you're, re you're reading a history of God and Israel's relationship with each other. And that all is inspired. What's recorded of that is inspired. And so the same is true for Genesis chapter 2 and 3. It's, it's, it's revealed, but it's also an inspired account of man's self-understanding. Because these stories would have been transmitted orally before they were written down. And they were preserved by the power of the Holy Spirit and by grace. So Genesis is an inspired account of man's self-understanding. And the primal experience of man revealed in Genesis is what John Paul refers to as original solitude, the aloneness of man. And, he, and John Paul draws two conclusions from that. First, created man, and this is a quote, created man finds himself from the first moment of his existence before God in search of his own being, one can say in search of his own definition, in search of his own identity. Every person, and this, this, is a, this is a 
a thought that Wojtyla had from even earlier in his life. Every person in this life is engaged in a subjective search for their identity, but it's an objective identity. So we, we, we're looking for something, but actually to find who we truly are, we have to find who we're created to be. What or who he is, uh, everyone is searching for what or who he is by accepting and living out the identity and vocation that God has inscribed in our very existence. The second conclusion, second conclusion that John Paul reaches from the Genesis narrative is that self-knowledge goes hand in hand with knowledge of the world. The man realizes he is alone in the garden because he realizes he is different from the other creatures in the garden. He is not like them. He is not the same as the animals. You can see how that thought alone is a sort of a corrective to uh, a current cultural um, fad of speaking only of my truth or that truth is always within, right? That I can't know myself without also knowing the world and where I am in the world. The body plays a significant role in man's realization that he is alone. For John Paul, it is the human body that reveals to the man that he is different. He walks on two legs. He has opposable thumbs. You know, he's not like the animals. The structure of the body, John Paul says, is what permits us to be the author of genuinely human activity. In this activity, and this is Remember very few things from this talk. Remember this. In this activity, the body expresses the person. This is fundamental and key for, for John Paul II. The body is how the person is expressed in the world. This is precisely why Adam's first reaction upon seeing Eve is not to notice their physical differences. The first thing he notices about her is that she is like him. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. They are not different. This is one of the central themes of the theology of the body. The body expresses the person. Now, if I could insert St. Thomas here, I mean, this is obviously a relevant characteristic of his thought. The word we use is hylomorphism for any of the philosophers in the room, which is the theory that the body and soul are so united, so intertwined that they are, in a sense, and this, even speaking about it this way fails, codependent on each other, right? For the St. Thomas, the human person is not just a body or just a soul. The human person is body-soul. It's a composite. Aquinas had realized that the body and soul are inextricably linked in every person's activity. The body being the material, the soul being the rational, the formal part of us. The body being what we share with animals on our lower side, the soul and the intellect, what makes us distinctively human, our higher side. The body is made for the soul, for St. Thomas, but this does not mean that the body is simply a mere instrument of the soul because the human soul is such that it needs the body. When we die and our bodies are separate, our souls are separated from the body, we do not become angels, regardless of what Hallmark tells you. Aquinas' insistence upon this fact is so consist is consistent throughout his life and his work for example, he holds that there is certainly an immaterial element to human thought that can't be explained by bodily organs. So he's not a materialist in this sense. Thoughts about freedom and love and God and marriage cannot be simply explained by the firing of synapses in the brain. Right. But yet, if he were alive today, he would be fascinated by the findings of neuroscience and neurology. I think he'd be fascinating by all the, fascinated by all the uh, studies that when they put people in like a CAT scan or whatever scanner this is and different parts of the brain light up when you're thinking about different things, he would, he would be very fascinated by that. He would agree with all of that, that the, even the immaterial element needs the body. 
but is not reducible to the body. He doesn't deny the need for the material part. He is so consistent that the human person is a composite of body and soul that he argues that after death, when our soul separates from the body and is, God willing, united to God in the beatific vision, the soul is still in some sense not quite itself because it doesn't have the body, which is why the general resurrection of the dead is part of the Christian understanding of, of our life with God. Obviously, it's not deficient or lacking or because it's got the beatific vision. I mean, you have God. You don't need anything after that, but it's not quite itself. So for St. Thomas and St. John Paul II, the body plays a major role in the person and in the importance of relationships with ourselves, with others, between the sexes, and then ultimately even with God. This is exactly what distinguishes our personhood from the personhood of God in the Trinity and, say, the personhood of angels. We are embodied persons. For St. John, Paul II, the creation of the woman in the garden has significant ramifications for the experience of being human because it means that mankind now has two complementary ways of being body and existing in the body, two complementary ways of being human, male and female. He even goes so far to say that it's sort of two metaphysical incarnations of humanity male and female. The complementarity has a special meaning for the body when man and woman come together in the conjugal act. The human body and its male-female complementarity has what John Paul II calls a spousal attribute or a spousal meaning. It directs the person to the other in a gift of self. Earlier in his career, in Love and Responsibility, he speaks more frankly of this when he talks about the sexual urge. That the sexual urge, which um, late and this afternoon we'll talk more about this, uh, which has to be uh, mastered in virtue, is one of the most concrete ways that our bodies tell us that we cannot uh, be satisfied on our own. That we are, we are moved towards others. The conjugal union, he says, this is a direct quote, carries within itself a particular awareness of the meaning that the bo of the body in the reciprocal self-gift of the person. You see, you see where we're going here. It's not just about sex. It's not just about the sexual urge. It's about the gift of self to the other, which is manifest preeminently in the conjugal act but not exclusively so. So there's a deeper reason than sex and the sexual urge that the body, that the human person is directed outward to the other in the gift, and it has to do with the act of creation. Here's what St. John Paul II says, quote, Genesis introduces us into the mystery of creation, that is, of the beginning of the world by the will of God, who is omnipotence and love. Consequently, every creature, every creature, bears within itself the sign of the original and fundamental gift, the gift of existence. Creation is a gift because man appears in it who, as an image of God, is able to understand the very meaning of the gift in the call from nothing to existence. So for John Paul, the uniqueness of humanity is not only that we are called from nothing into existence, which is a gift, because all creatures are. The uniqueness is that we can understand the gift because we are made in the image of God. We can understand that this gift has a directionality to it. We are called out of nothingness into existence, toward communion with other persons, and ultimately toward communion with God. You see the directionality there. Nothingness, existence, the communio personarum, the communion of persons in this life, and then the communion of persons with God in the next. 
this is, for, in St. Thomas's language, he would say this is the final cause. This is the teleology that every creature is created for. The body is a witness to this directionality because it is a witness to the love from which the original gift of creation springs. Men and women through their bodies are able to live this gift with each other in a unique way. The physical differences between the sexes are ordered to procreation. It's true, yes. But for St. John Paul II, the body's meaning and value goes beyond biological procreation to the expression of love and communion, to the expression of a gift. Thus, the spousal meaning of the body concerns not only procreation, it concerns the communion of persons in love in marriage. So one way to say this technically is that procreation and is, is a su- necessary but not a sufficient explanation for the conjugal act. In the theology of the body, marriage is intended not only for biological procreation, but to propagate the gift of creation through the gift of self from one generation to the next. So you have a couple, they come together, they give themselves to each other, and then new persons come out of that, receiving the same gift from nothingness into existence. And this goes on and on ultimately called to communion with God. Somewhere, I think it's John Paul II says that a parent's best legacy is not what they leave behind, but their children entering the beatific vision. That's that's the, really the goal of every parent, or ought to be. Not whether they have a college degree or they're successful, but whether they make it to God. But this is also why this, this notion that Marriage is intended to propagate the gift of creation is also why procreation is so important because it is a sign of the fruitfulness of the couple's gift. He says this communion of man and woman had been intended to make man and woman mutually happy through the simple and pure union. Those are key words which we will get to go over a little bit more this afternoon, but the simple and pure union of a a reciprocal offering of themselves, that is, through the experience of the gift of the person expressed with soul and body, and through the subordination of such a union to the blessing of fruitfulness with procreation. So hopefully now the shape of what John Paul is doing is becoming clear. The human person, whether man or woman, created in the image of God through a gratuitous gift that this, that Sorry, the human person, whether a man or a woman, created in the image of God through a gratuitous gift from that same God, is unique in all of creation because the human person can understand the gift. This uniqueness stems from the fact that the human person, every human person, is a free person engaged in uniquely human activity through the body in which they are called out of themselves toward communion with one another and ultimately with God. And so human existence, even though it's characterized by a certain existential solitude, separating man from all other creatures, is nonetheless marked by this drive for the other. And the drive for the other is manifest in the human body just as much as it's written in our very existence. The drive for the other, this capacity for love and self-gift, is the spousal meaning of the body. When you hear people talk about that in the theology of the body, the spousal mean it's this drive and this self, this capacity for gift to the other that the body manifests and, and, and reveals. Now, at the beginning of time in that Genesis narrative, John Paul says that man and woman, Adam and Eve, understood this. They had an intuitive understanding of the meaning of their bodies. They knew that they were made to be gift to each other. But Sin ruins all of this, sorry to say. After the sin, after sin, the body is no longer as effective in communicating the person. 
Sin introduces concupiscence, which is unmoderated desire, particularly unmoderated sensual desire, which is a threat to the whole structure of the person because concupiscence, John Paul says, threatens our self-mastery, our mastery over ourselves. With sin, our bodies revolt against our person. How much, I would just ask, how much of our culture today is really a problem with the body? Either overemphasizing it on one hand, and this will, I think, help the transgender conversation later, this overemphasis on the body, which is what that is, essentially, or an underemphasis on the body, that my body is insignificant to who I am. We are no longer masters of our body inherently because of sin. We're no longer masters of our sensual desires. We are no longer, therefore, completely free in that sense. And if we do not have the interior freedom of self-mastery, then, in fact, we cannot make a simple gift of ourselves to another. If we are not masters of ourselves, we cannot give ourselves because we cannot give what we do not possess. And if we don't possess ourselves, it can, we can't be given as a gift. And so in this battle, our very nature craves the other, looks to the other in order to be gift for the other. But concupiscence also means that we are always craving, always desiring the other for ourselves. We are never satisfied. So this desire combined with concupiscence means precisely that the union of man and woman is no longer so simple and so pure. In fact, it becomes insatiable. John Paul, when he reads God's um, uh, punishment of Eve, and he says, you know, your desire will be for your husband. He, he notes that this essentially means that the union will be insatiable. This is because of sin. The union never fully satisfies. The interior struggle of our body's impulses can alienate us from the body. The body can become something else than the thing it was created to be, what it was created to be, which is to contribute to my identity and my being, become something separate from me. And so it's not surprising that the spousal meaning of the body, this inherent direction of the body to the other, is now so confused, regardless of cultural milieu. After original sin, given the alienation of the person from the body, the body becomes, um, these are words of John Paul, a sort of territory of domination. And the spousal meaning of the body is no longer apparent to us intuitively. It's no longer apparent as a gift. And so he says that the task of men and women after sin is in fact to reconstruct the meaning of the body the gift of self, and he says this takes great effort. The inherent spousal meaning of the body is not destroyed by sin. The body can still communicate, but because of sin, our communications with our body are distorted. And not just in the conjugal act, but all of our communications. The ability to lie, the ability to put on a good face when in fact... You're angry or sad. The inability we labor under to communicate honestly with each other, all of this is part of the same thing, original sin. And this is why we need Christ's redemption. I'm going to speak about this just briefly here because we'll talk more about it this afternoon, but just for the sake of um, fullness here. In the theology of the body, as in the rest of the Christian tradition, redemption is not only about salvation, and getting into heaven, it's about a complete salvation, which includes redeeming the body. Building off St. Paul's observations in chapter 5 in the letter of the, to the Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. John Paul notes that in giving his own body and sacrifice for love of the church, his bride, Christ redeeming love also becomes a spousal love. 
and therefore elevates the, spot, the, the body and marriage and spousal love. The redemption by Christ recreates and redeems the spousal meaning of the body. Now, just to be clear, the idea that the body needs to be redeemed is in no way intended to imply that the body is evil. Far from it for John Paul. Redemption, the Pope said, quote, point, points only to man's sinfulness by which he lost, among other things, the clear sense of the spousal meaning of the body in which the interior dominion and freedom of the spirit expresses itself. We need the redemption of the body through Christ's offering of his own body to receive the healing grace necessary to regain the freedom over our sensual cravings, to regain true interior freedom so that we can truly make a gift of ourselves to another. So in John Paul's view, man must seek the meaning of his existence and the meaning of his humanity by reaching to the mystery of creation, but through the mystery of redemption as the lens. You can't stop at original sin. Because it's only through the reality of the redemption that we find the essential answer to what the body and the meaning of the body is. You can see, going to Gaudium et Spes, which John mentioned last night, you can see here a common theme. The grace of Jesus Christ reveals to us not only what it means to be God, but what it means to be man. Redemption culminates in the next life in which men and women will participate in the inner life of God himself. This, is a, this exchange is a fruit of grace. It's God's self-communication in his very divinity, not only to the soul, but to the whole. And here you got to forgive John Paul's uh, philosophical language, but to the whole of man's psychosomatic subjectivity, which is to say the whole body and soul. This is why the Lord teaches there is no marriage in the world to come. And so the spousal meaning of the body redeemed in Jesus Christ in the next life is divinized into what John Paul calls the virginal meaning of the body. When we are united to God in heaven, we will make ourselves a complete gift to him and he will make himself a complete gift to us in freedom and in purity. This, by the way, is where the consecrated religious and priests who are vowed to celibacy sort of figure into the theology of the body as, as a sign or a witness of the fact that the spousal of the meaning of the body is in fact directed to the virginal meaning of the body. Even though the spousal meaning of the body is proceeding toward the virginal meaning through redemption in the hereafter, Marriage remains in this life the primary place that the spousal meaning of the body is lived. So while it is true he speaks about other vocations in the theology of the body, his focus is on marriage. Because Humane Vitae's focus was on marriage, which was his inspiration. So just to uh, give a few points on this before I conclude. It's in the marital act that the spousal meaning of the body is on full display in this life. Because, precisely because the body has a meaning, a drive to the other, it's also the case, therefore, that the body, for John Paul, speaks a language. Men and women use their body to communicate with one another and the world. We use words, facial expressions, and so forth. The body also communicates communicates often according to our will as it communicates, but oftentimes it can communicate on its own when someone can tell that you're lying, even though you're trying to, not to show them, or someone can tell that you're sad, even though you're trying not to show them. St. Thomas um, believes the same thing. He's got, when he talks about the angels, he says that the angels can't read your heart or your soul. Um, only God can read your heart, your intentions. But because your body is so involved in this, angels can get pretty close because they're just very good. I'm obviously translating into our modern uh, dialogue here. They can read all of your nonverbals better than anybody else can, right? Because they're angels. And your everything goes on in the soul is somewhere on the body. 
right? The problem is that because of sin, communicating with the language of the body, especially in the conjugal act, is now no longer so simple. So in this reconstruction, what John Paul says, couples have to work to reread, that's his word, to reread the language of the body, which is to say couples have to regain the objective meaning of the body. The, bo the meaning of the body was created to communicate. The body's language should communicate the spousal meaning of the body, the gift of self, but because of the effects of sin, this communication can often be corrupted by individuals and even by spouses acting together because we can act at cross purposes to what the body is naturally trying to communicate. When we communicate with each other, when, commu when couples communicate with each other, they must communicate in the truth. John Paul says, quote, if the human being in marriage, and indirectly he says also in all spheres of life together, gives to his behavior a meaning in conformity with the fundamental truth of the language of the body, then he is in the truth. In the opposite case, he commits lies and falsifies the language of the body. So now you might see the conclusion here. In their interactions, couples must not use their bodies or communicate with their bodies in ways that are contrary to the truth. And the truth that they're meant to consent to, to communicate is very specifically the consent that they exchange on their wedding day in which they give each up themselves to each other before God in the church. So, since when couples, for example, use contraception, they speak a lie with their bodies, even if they both agreed to speak this lie, because they are withholding a very essential aspect of their bodies. They are withholding a very essential gift, which is their fertility from each other. And so Paul VI's famous line that the unitive and procreative dimensions of the conjugal act are inseparable is true for St. John Paul II precisely because the unitive, the union of husband and wife is communicated through the bodily procreative. And the procreative is the fruit of the unitive. You can't have one without the other. You can't tell your spouse, I love you, and at the same time withhold something from your spouse. Attempting to communicate the unitive without the procreative is not, in fact, unitive. It's a lie that doesn't respect the objective reality of the body and the structure of the human person. So, in these 130 catechesis, John Paul is arguing that the body communicates in a way that is not arbitrary and that is not incidental to the person. That is, fallen but redeemed through Christ, and therefore requires Christians, by the grace of Christ, to work hard to reconstruct and to, ma and to, and to have self-mastery, an objective reality of how the body is created and what is created to communicate. The objective structure of creation cannot, for John Paul, be sacrificed in favor of the experiential or the psychological or some other subjective experience of the human person. At the, at the very basic level, respect for God's creation is respect for God. But even more so, it's the fulfillment of the human person through the redemption of Jesus Christ. Thank you. So questions? I understand. All right, Meg, right? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the question is, what is a theological or philosophical justification why human, why female bodies are the way they are, especially that uh, they're only fertile so, so much? So I've done a lot of work, especially before Oberkfell, on same-sex marriage and all of this. There was um, 
I'm blanking out. The all all seems so long ago now. Um, he he actually came out. He wrote a whole book from a socio a philosophical biological side for defending marriage between men and women. And then he actually came out in favor of same sex marriage uh, later. But uh, the book is still very good. And yeah, the future of marriage is the title of the book. Uh, first chapter, though, he goes into this. I'm not sure I can give you a theological reason. I can tell you what I think is the right reason, but I think it has to do with monogamy and uh, making, it has to do with making men better fathers, quite honestly, okay? Um, what he goes through on this is that the female body, the fem okay, boy, we're really, this is really kind of going, yeah, so I, I hope, you know, anyhow, we're all adults here. Um, the female body, he, he, he goes through on this, that is, is unlike any other sexual female in, 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 the world, in, the, in the world that we know of, any other creature. I'll just use Christian language here. Everything from the fact, every creature, of course, has a fertility period, right? But there are things involved here about the female. The human female hides when she's in estrus. She does not give off signals to males that she's fertile in the way other, she's in fact the only creature that doesn't. It's really remarkable, right? Um, my mother, we, she, bred, we, she bred Yorkshire Terriers when I was growing up and I still, I mean, I was just a child. I have no idea when she knew Cricket was ready to be bred, but she could tell Cricket was in heat. That's the language. We don't speak that way um, about humans. So that's one element. Uh, this means that males, if you're going to buy into, you know, the idea that, you know, um, the whole point here is the propagation of the species. This means that not any single sexual act can be guaranteed to produce offspring. Whereas in the animal world, pretty much every sexual act can produce offspring because they only have sex when the female is in heat. In fact, um, now, I don't want to go too far out on line on this. I am pretty sure uh, th it's, this is the case because uh, human females are also the only sexual female who can, in fact, engage in coitus outside of her the time that she's fertile. Uh, the only time the act happens for animals is when the female is, is in heat. Right? So what you're talking about then is the conjugal act or the sexual act being able to happen at any time but not knowing if it's actually going to produce the effect of offspring, therefore requiring multiple acts of, of coitus in order to produce offspring. All right? Now, because that's one element of this. The second element is the orientation of the female genitalia as front-facing. The human species is the only species in which the sexual act engages face-to-face. -face. And so they look at each other. And this creates bonding. It creates a pair bond. All right. So, I mean, this guy is not a Christian. He's not even a Catholic. I mean, he's not a Christian. He's not a believer. And so his argument is all of this through the history of the human species created a situation in which males had to basically choose a female and have repeated sexual acts with her to have offspring looking at her face to face, thereby creating a psychological pair bond, leading to monogamy and eventually cultures and societies protecting that. Right? The human male is the only primate. All of this, this, this all comes from future of marriage. Did you look it up? <laughs> no, that's not it. There might be multiple books. Um, all of this goes to this point where the human male, while other an male animals do recognize their children, none of, no primate does but the human male. He recognizes his children. That's because he has a relationship with the mother of his children. David That's it. It's Blankenhorn. Yeah, David Blankenhorn. The future of marriage. So I think all of that goes into this. you know. And John Paul kind of, obviously he never got as frank in this, in love and responsibility, he gets a little bit more frank than he does in theology of the body. But he's, he is very insistent that um, fatherhood 
is an achievement of the human species. And it has all to do with the relationship fathers have with mothers. And that mothers actually make men better fathers. Right. Is that helpful at all? Probably not a good theological reason there, but it's it's fascinating things. These are fascinating fascinating things to think about. Um, yeah. Probably didn't expect that answer, but <laughs> you have a question? Yes. Um, I noticed that uh, when you mentioned that when you mentioned that we when we're no longer masters of our body, we can only give ourselves to somebody else. Uh, Implicit in this statement is the idea that knowledge of the body is the same as mastery of the body, right? Um, I was wondering if this meant that subject, uh, subject, object, ontology, this idea that what we know is also what we master, is incompatible with the object of the body, or if it's something more like my niece that doesn't assume that what we know is necessarily what we master, could still be compatible. Right. So the question is whether or not what we know is necessarily the same as what we master, you know, and this getting into the whole subject object understanding. John Paul goes into that sort of phraseology and that kind of talk more in his pre theology of the body writing. So, like in Love and Responsibility or The Acting Person. But certainly, knowledge of oneself does not necessarily, I mean, it can go hand in hand in, in, with self mastery, but you can have a certain limited knowledge without self-mastery, right? When he talks about self-mastery, and we'll see this a little bit more this afternoon, he's really talking about what traditionally we would call virtue, you know, and learning to uh, sublimate and redirect sexual urges and sensual urges, you know, in this, in this, you know, in this context that we're talking about. Um, that's probably all as far as I'd want to go on that with this, on this point. Um, it does mean, for instance, just concretely, and we see this, this epidemic of pornography in our culture. Pornography does not aid in self-mastery of the sexual urge. It, 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 it amplifies it and makes it difficult. And so this is why you see marriages, I mean, if you have a problem with pornography, to really start to work, engage in the process of self-mastery with regard to that, because it, 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 we see that it does cause marriages to break down, right? Because it's, it's not, not only does it not tend and yield to self-mastery, but it also is, um, it's not real. Pornography is not real in that sense. It's not really what sex is or the conjugal act is. This afternoon, we'll talk more about that when, when John Paul talks about shame, you know, and the shame in sex. This is one thing that married couples don't have. All right. When I taught at Providence College, I used to tell the young students that uh, once you're married, there's no such thing as a walk of shame. Right. <laughs> so it's just it's just part of the married married life. And I don't think that anyone who has sex outside of marriage is while they're experiencing the biological act of it and maybe getting some pleasure from it, obviously, they're not really experiencing sex in the way it really is. F complete free and get and uh, completely free and a gift. Yes. How do you pragmatically explain that to someone what you just said that you're living a lie uh, when you use contraception and that? So the question is, how do I explain to that to someone concretely when they use contraception that they're living a lie? Well, pretty much just like you just said it. You know, um, I, I, I tend to think, and I think, uh, you know, we have some young priests from the House of Studies here. I tend to think that the best way to be pastoral with people is to bring them to truth, you know, and... Sometimes that means, depending on the relationship and the person, sometimes that means being blunt, and sometimes that means being gentle, but still saying essentially that, that this is a lie, and it's not, it's not good for you. And you, you, know, you can, and you can pull out everything you need to pull out, which is, you know, we know, for instance, young women who start using contraception, sometimes, I mean, I don't know how common this is anymore. When I was growing up, you'd hear young women being prescribed the pill, you know, for acne or 
you know, for period regulation. And then they just stay on it and stay on it and stay on it. They get married. And then by the time they're 30, they want to have children, they get off of it. And it's aged their uterus like twice as fast. And they, they're no longer, these are unnatural hormones. These are unnatural things, you know, being put into the body. So that's how I would start it. But I would, I would talk to them about the nature of the, of the body, the nature of marriage, the communion of love. And even if, and see that the hard point, the hard part is when you have a couple and they agree, like they, they, they've committed themselves to a childless marriage for now. And they, they're, they, they're on the pill or whatever it is. Um, there's so many ways to go at, at this, just so, even se from secular science perspective, you know, that the pill is just not a good thing f for women's bodies, just in the long haul. It really isn't. Um, but to get to them theologically that they're not living as God intends them to live. I presume if they're talking to me, they're already believers, right? So, yeah. Yes, sir. Last question. My question is about um, the master of the body. Yes, uh, the Bible is teaching us that uh, the self control is one of the fruit of the spirit. When someone receives the Holy Spirit, you receive also, uh, you can might express it the self control. So, my question is what is the link between the self control and the master of the body? And uh, do I. Uh, or do we uh, be teach about how to practice the self comfort or the master of the body? Or when you receive uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, you will express it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so the question is the gift of the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit in self control and the mastery of the body and how how that goes. So. John Paul goes into that. I think St. Thomas answers this better. You know, in some ways. Um, that obviously self-mastery and perfect self-mastery in this life, I think, can only be had with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, right, and living in grace. Um, now, for St. Thomas, that can, what we would refer to as like the infused virtues. I mean, you can think of ways in which people can have self-control or continence and even, or even a certain temperance and chastity, but that it could still be difficult for them to practice, you know, but they practice it through the grace of the spirit because they, they love Jesus Christ. They love the church. This is what Jesus wants, right? That's quite different than some sort of, uh, than uh, the Herculean, oftentimes Herculean attempt to, I'm going to avoid, you know, this kind of situation, or I'm going to avoid, you know, watching a movie with my girlfriend at 10 o'clock at night because then, you know, things start to happen. And, you know, so, so there's a difference between sort of acquiring a sort of um, chastity and self-mastery through Herculean attempts, which is part of it, but then also using the grace of Christ that we're given in the Holy Spirit that empowers us to do this, not simply because I want to be a master of myself, but because I love Jesus Christ. Right, and I want to stay in communion with Jesus Christ. I want to stay in communion with God. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this lecture on the Thomistic Institute podcast. The generosity of people like you makes this podcast possible. If you enjoy these talks, please consider showing your support at www.thomisticinstitute.org/donate. Your donation of even a dollar helps us reach more college students and many others with the powerful truths of the faith, and it ensures that we can keep publishing top-notch lectures on this podcast. Thanks a lot.